Well, the one thing we know is that you can't have a mission until you have a patch. <laughs> and uh, I was assigned as patch chairman on this flight, so my, my goal was to come up with a patch that told a little bit of story about the mission. And before I get started, I can't necessarily take credit for this design logo. Mike Sandy, who uh, was a, an artist for Lockheed Martin, who's moved back east now, came up with this design. But what the design tells you, in the uh, center top portion of the patch is Orpheus Spa satellite, the uh, spectrograph astronomy satellite that we deployed on day one. Connected it at the bottom of the three red lines, which are a portion of the astronaut symbol, and those are there to represent, in fact, the astronaut office involvement with these satellites. The two satellites we took up were both free flyers <coughs> and for a large portion did a lot of science on their own. But we would like to emphasize our portion in getting in there and help conducting the science. At the bottom portion, that is the Wake Shield satellite that uh, Story was, in, was deeply involved with the entire time it was deployed. You'll notice in the dark blue background, there are stars. There are 16 white stars represent a day for each, or uh, one star for each day of the flight. There's also two larger blue stars, which were to represent the EVAs. And <coughs> I've got to tell you now, when I put those on, I was also hopeful that we would wind up with the record duration mission. So if you count those two, that's 18 days, and in fact, that's what our mission turned out to be. <laughs> Pretty clever. <laughs> I did that on my last flight, and we didn't get that extra day. <laughs> the, uh, and then lastly, around the perimeter, the uh, gray area where the names are encompassed, if you look at that and kind of remove the shuttle, you'll see a C. And uh, the, it's kind of appropriate that that C stands for Columbia. Uh, the commander, Cockrell, also <laughs> enjoyed that C. <laughs> But the, uh, and then obviously the center of the patch, what we really wanted to tell also was the space shuttle mission, and there's the on-orbit configuration of the space shuttle while we conducted the science. They call it the Vomit Comet. It's the next best thing to actually being in orbit. This NASA KC-135 cargo plane simulates weightlessness by executing roller coaster maneuvers in midair, delivering a series of 40-second bursts of nausea-inducing free fall. Astronauts use it to train for shuttle missions. Go, man, go. And Hollywood used it to film the weightless special effects showcased in last year's blockbuster movie, Apollo 13. Wishing everyone back on Earth uh, a pleasant evening. Now, plant researchers Robert Furl and Christine Doherty of the University of Florida are using it to find out why plants, like humans, get sick in space. The space environment's a hostile environment basically for all life forms that have developed here on Earth under a normal one gravity situation. Humans get sick in space, plants get sick in space. Researchers say experiments with plants flown aboard the shuttle have turned up a disturbing trend. In the microgravity environment of orbit, the plants grow poorly, showing signs of stress, often failing to produce fruit or seeds. Plants that have flown in space, uh, they generally do okay. They don't do really well. In particular, they don't do well at making seeds in space. And a lot of investigators have found recently that plants that come back from space actually look like or act like they've been flooded. And that's a problem that could complicate NASA's long-term goals to build and support space stations, interplanetary spacecraft, and eventually colonies on the moon or Mars. If you are ever going to permanent leave the earth or, or leave the earth for an extended period of time you've got to have a life support system that will sustain you and and ultimately the the only way that we know that to recycle most of uh, the major components and to produce food for people has, has got to include plants using chambers that can be sealed to mimic the closed artificial growing conditions of space nasa is developing space agriculture at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, scientists are working to develop strains of wheat, soybeans, tomatoes, and other crops that will one day feed long-term space dwellers. Robert Furrow's lab is helping that effort by engineering something called a reporter gene into plants that have flown on the Vomit Comet and will fly on a shuttle mission scheduled for next summer. What they are are genes that respond to particular sorts of stresses, stresses that the plants uh, experience in microgravity on the space shuttle or other similar environments and then report back to us as the investigators what that experience has been. The reporter genes allow researchers to tell at a glance which genes are turned on while a plant is growing in orbit and which are not. When the plants experience a stress, either induced uh, in space or in the parabolic flights on the KC-135, 
the genes that are part of the plant's response to that particular stress get turned on. We visualize that turning on of particular genes as a color change that uh, is either blue or purple. Using the reporter genes, the scientists hope to pinpoint how microgravity is adversely affecting the plants. Then down the road, the researchers can fine-tune the growing conditions, like light and temperature, to maximize the plant's growth and minimize the stress of weightlessness. The astronauts who will live aboard the International Space Station, set to begin assembly next year, will keep growing plants in space. But actual use of a plant-based life support system could be as much as 40 years away. Robert Furl and other researchers say that by then, we'll know how to grow healthy plants in space. Dick Wilson, CNN, Gainesville, Florida. and Galileo space probes have taken snapshots of Europa. Scientists meeting this week in California say the pictures indicate an immense ocean under Europa's icy shell. That would make Europa Earth's only neighbor with its own swimming pool. Scientists are discussing sending a probe to search for life on Europa if the money can be found here on Earth. How long has life existed on Earth? Well, scientists now say the answer to that question is 3.8 billion years, almost half a billion years longer than previously thought. Researchers have found traces of carbon material embedded in an ancient rock formation in Greenland. They believe the deposits of carbon found in the rock are the remains of tiny bacteria-like organisms. Up until now, the oldest record of life on Earth has been a 3.5 billion year old microscopic fossil found in Australia. Scientists published their new findings in this week's edition of the British journal Nature. Die Ariane hat in der Nacht zwei Satelliten in ihre Umlaufbahn gebracht. Es war der zehnte geglückte Start in diesem Jahr. Die Fernmeldesatelliten wurden für die Staaten der Arabischen Liga und Malaysia ausgesetzt. Die Ariane 4 Rakete ist vergangene Nacht vom Weltraumbahnhof in Französisch Guyana ins Weltall gestartet. Dort hat sie zwei Kommunikationssatelliten ausgesetzt, einen für die 21 Staaten der Arabischen Liga und einen für Malaysia. Nach dieser erfolgreichen Mission hat die Betreibergesellschaft noch 40 weitere Aufträge für Satellitentransporte in ihren Büchern stehen. Show a tangle of cracks and grooves on Europa that could be large plates or slabs of ice covering an ocean of water. If the ocean exists, researchers say it may be up to 60 miles deep and contain three times as much water as the Earth. Water is necessary for life as we know it, so is heat, and no one knows that there's heat on Europa. The Galileo space probe will pass close to Europa next month and send back new pictures of its surface. 61-year-old astronaut Story Musgrave will become the oldest person in space. CNN's John Holliman has more on the man and the mission. Space Shuttle Columbia is cleared for flight and is ready to send a crew of five into orbit for two weeks. The mission is chock full of satellite launches, spacewalks, and satellite retrievals. Our flight has a lot to do with the future of space station uh, and, and a lot to do with uh, materials processing and uh, astronomical science. The crew will send out a German-built satellite with an X-ray telescope and then release a space factory called Wake Shield. Both will orbit close to the shuttle and the astronauts will have to pay close attention to keep them from banging into each other. Astronauts have never before tried to monitor two satellites at the same time. I think uh, anytime you you stress yourself by uh, adding an extra dimension to the complexity of, of the flight you, you tend to learn things. And, and what this is going to do is give us uh, a little bit of a warm-up for operating a, a space station. 
In fact, most of this mission will test the ability of Americans to operate a space station. Two astronauts, Tammy Jernigan and Tom Jones, will be outside conducting spacewalks. They've spent the last few months underwater training to operate a space crane and other space station equipment. For 61-year-old Story Musgrave, this flight will be his last. He joined NASA in 1967 and planned to go to Mars. For astronaut Musgrave and the Columbia crew, this trip into orbit might pave the way for humans on Mars. But the road will be much longer than Musgrave ever considered. John Holloman, CNN reporting. Once again, launch of the Space Shuttle Columbia scheduled to take place in about four and a half hours. CNN plans live coverage of that launch. Ready for liftoff. NASA's oldest shuttle and the five astronauts on board have a full schedule for their 16-day mission. They will release two satellites during that mission and conduct a number of medical experiments. They'll also be stretching their legs during some planned spacewalking. That's so the astronauts can test a number of new tools that could be used in the planned construction of a space station. The shuttle is scheduled to lift off in about three and a half hours, and CNN will provide live coverage. Wenn heute Abend um 20 Uhr und 53 Minuten unserer Zeit die US-Raumfähre Columbia startet, dann ist ein Top-Astronaut mit an Bord, auf den die NASA trotz seines vorgerückten Alters nicht verzichten kann. Wenn der Start gelingt, ist der Mann der Rekordjäger im Weltraum. Story Musgrave, hier links im Bild, ist dann mit 61 Jahren der älteste Mensch im All. Er ist der einzige, der mit allen fünf Raumfähren geflogen ist, auch mit der später verunglückten Challenger. Der Mann für alle Fälle hat vor drei Jahren auch die heikle Reparatur am Hubble-Teleskop durchgeführt. Als Musgrave vor rund 30 Jahren zur NASA ging, hieß der US-Präsident noch Lyndon B. Johnson. Der Weltraumtrip mit der Columbia soll nun Stories letzter sein, sagt zumindest die NASA. Tja, und auch die Zeit danach wird dem fünffachen Vater nicht lang werden. Er ist zwar schon Pilot und Fallschirmspringer, Chirurg und Literaturwissenschaftler, aber er möchte seinen sechsten akademischen Titel unbedingt noch die Abschlüsse in Geschichte und Psychologie hinzufügen. So gebildet kommt man auch leichter durchs Leben. If all goes well for the next hour or so, it appears that the U.S. shuttle Columbia will soon be on its way into space for a very ambitious scientific mission. CNN's John Holloman is covering the shuttle. He joins us now with that story and uh, some more goings on in space. That's right. A lot happening on the space beat at this hour. John, um, all five of the space shuttle astronauts are inside Columbia. I think we have a live picture we can show you of the shuttle on the pad in Florida. Um, this is a picture um, of the closeout crew closing the hatch on the space shuttle, meaning that everybody's inside. We've got lots of pictures to show you of this five-person crew as it prepares to leave for 16 days out of this world. The astronaut breakfast this morning showed the entire crew from NASA's oldest astronaut, Snorri Musgrave, down the line to Commander Ken Cockrell and, and others. You can see Musgrave there. He's uh, the only person I've ever seen on television with less hair than I have, but he's there. That's the rest of the crew. They're laughing and happy as they uh, get ready to make some history. John, let me jump in. Story Musgrave, the oldest astronaut ever, is not really all that old. He's 61 years young. Uh, does that count against him in the space business? Uh, that, he says no. NASA says no. The fact is, he uh, was interviewed earlier today and said the thing that is most impressive to him is not that he is old. The thing that's most impressive to him is he started uh, with NASA during the Apollo moonwalk program and stuck with it. He never quit. He never gave up. He never left NASA to take a big money job in the private sector. And that's why he's still flying today. He still knows his stuff. He's a fascinating guy. There was um, an emotional scene today as the crew walked out of their quarters and boarded the bus for the ride out to Launch Complex 39. Lots of cheering for the entire group. On this mission, the astronauts will launch two satellites, conduct a couple of spacewalks to test space station equipment and then retrieve the satellites and bring them all back to Earth. Earlier today, I talked to astronaut Jim Newman, who will be on the first flight to build the space station, and he told me that uh, NASA will definitely be ready to build this station by the time he goes up in a little more than a year from now to start putting the pieces together. He says the spacewalks this mission to test a space crane and other heavy handling equipment will pave the way for his flight. Also from space today, dramatic new picture. I've, I have a theory that people love red, yellow, and orange pictures, and there are a couple of interesting ones. This is a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. It shows a couple of galaxies more than 1.5 billion light years away as they pound into each other at a speed of about a million miles an hour. 
This picture and others of other galaxies have caused theorists to rethink their ideas about the origin of quasars, the most powerful objects in the universe. Back to the shuttle again, just for a second. It's going to leave for orbit a little over an hour from now. CNN International, of course, will bring you live coverage of the whole thing, not only the launch, but uh, I'll be with you throughout the mission to let you know what's happening. It is a fascinating project. As always, they're still talking about the space station. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there really going to be a space station? Is there going to be money? Uh, and is there going to be a desire to really build this thing? Well, it's, there's going to be a space station, John, because there, is all, there are all these pieces of it on the ground in Huntsville, Alabama, in Houston, Texas. The Japanese are putting their pieces together. The Russians uh, are working on their modules for this thing, too. And uh, so, yeah, it will happen. It may not be as international as it was planned a couple of years ago, because some of the partners may be out of money and drop out. But uh, um, there's going to be something up there that's, uh, that's going to be a space station uh, put together by people other than the Russians, who have the exclusive uh, orbiting space station now. Okay, John Holland, we'll be back with you in a short time for the liftoff. Be fun. Leon? liftoff of the Space Shuttle Columbia, which is to carry astronaut Story Musgrave into orbit. At 61, he is to be the oldest man ever in space. Liftoff before this edition of World News from Washington concludes, and we will have live coverage of that when it happens. The Space Shuttle Columbia should be taking off at just about any moment from Florida, from the uh, launch pad down there. We're going to pick up with the countdown. We're steady. At 425. 450. This is hydrogen concentrations in the aft. 70. We're going to... 590. There is a brief hold, or what could be a brief hold, apparently, in the uh, launch pattern here. Uh, there's already been 11 days of delay, and the Columbia, when it gets off, will be departing on a 16-day mission. NASA put off the launch before because of some insulation burns discovered on another shuttle. And then there were dangerously high winds at the launch site at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We should note that on board this mission are NASA's oldest astronaut. He's 61-year-old Story Musgrave, as well as four other astronauts. And now we're going to join up with CNN's coverage and our uh, space correspondent, John Holliman. Shuttle launch director Jim Harrington, whose voice you heard talking to the astronauts, telling them that uh, even though um, an alarm went off about the, uh, the hydrogen um, concentration back there, they think it's within Watching acceptable hydrogen limits. concentrations, which are turning above and below acceptable limits. The 575 number that you just heard is the concentration of parts per million of uh, hydrogen gas in that aft compartment. Solid rocket booster hydraulic power units have started. Sound suppression water system armed. Rain safety systems armed. 10, 9, 8. Ignition sequence start. 7, 6. Three main engines up and burning. 2, 1. And liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia on a diversified mission of astronomy and commercial space research.
Columbia, roll program. Roger, roll, Columbia. Houston is now controlling. The roll maneuver is complete. Columbia is in a heads-down, wings-level position, headed to its 190 nautical mile orbit. Twenty-eight seconds into the flight, Columbia's engines are now beginning to throttle down to 67% of rated thrust. As the orbiter passes through the area of maximum aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle in the lower regions of the Earth's atmosphere. Columbia now miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center at an altitude of four miles. All three main engines, APUs, and fuel cells continuing to perform well. Columbia Houston, go at throttle up. Roger, go at throttle up. Columbia's three liquid-fueled engines are now back at full throttle, 104% of rated thrust. Columbia now traveling 1,800 miles per hour, 15 miles in altitude, downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, 13 miles. All three main engines continuing to perform well. The next event will be the burnout and separation of Columbia's twin solid rocket boosters. Columbia Houston performance nominal. Roger, performance nominal. Two minutes, 18 seconds into the flight. The and so the Space Shuttle Columbia is on its way out over the Atlantic with its crew of five at the beginning of a 16-day mission. And that's world news from Washington for today. I'm Charles Bierbarian for Sonia Rusler. Thanks for joining us. Columbia now downrange from the Kennedy Space Center at a distance of 55 miles, an altitude of 42 miles, traveling... Es geschah vor einer Dreiviertelstunde bei uns 21 Uhr in Florida noch heller Sonnenschein. Die amerikanische Raumführer Columbia bereit zum Start. Liftoff, das Raumschiff hat abgehoben an Bord, ein deutsch-amerikanisches Teleskop. Damit sollen aus höherer und klarerer Warte neue und sterbende Sterne beobachtet werden. Und auch der Jupiter und die Mondoberfläche. Nach zwei Wochen soll das Gerät dann wieder in die Ladebucht und zurück auf die Erde. Übrigens, einer der Astronauten, Story Musgrave, ist bereits 61 Jahre alt. Der älteste Mensch, der je ins Weltall flog. And liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia on a diversified mission of astronomy and commercial space research. The U.S. Space Shuttle Columbia is now in orbit, but concerns were raised after NASA engineers spotted something they'd never seen before. Flames appeared to leap between the two solid rockets toward the liquid fuel tank as Columbia was launched one and a half hours ago. Columbia's astronauts report the empty fuel tank was jettisoned and looked undamaged. The 16-day mission had been delayed by nearly two weeks because of bad weather and concerns about the booster rockets. The U.S. Space Shuttle Columbia lifted off Tuesday with quite a glow. NASA scientists explained that what looked like an unusual fire between the solid rockets was actually an effect caused by recirculating hot gases. Well, Columbia said on the launch pad the uh, five of us were uh, having breakfast and then getting suited up. Uh, here I am uh, waving to the kids. Rommel is uh, just about to go through the pressure check of his uh, uh, launch and entry suit, and that's what Tammy is doing here as well. These suits are not totally uncomfortable, but they're not the kind of thing that you'd like to wear, here's Tom, uh, for any extended period of time, and, you, and getting into and out of them is not real pleasant, so it was nice that we launched on the first day. Uh, it would have been, uh, well, it was, a, it was a reasonable trade to have to get in and out of the suit two or three times in order to um, get the extra couple of days on orbit. 
It, last day was absolutely a beautiful day, something new to me. On my last flight, I climbed in the vehicle several times before we went anywhere. Here are the engines that are lightened six seconds prior to liftoff. The, the vehicle stack goes through its twang, but when the, solid, when the solids light like this, there's no doubt in your mind you're going somewhere. We had a cadence. Tom started it. He said 102, 102. The computer from mode 102. I said auto, auto. Pitch and roll yaws were in auto and not CSS. And Taco was supposed to say, go, there goes the tower. But by the time he could say, there goes the tower, the tower had already gone. <laughs> and we're doing a, more than 100 miles an hour at that point. <coughs> Here are the solids. What's interesting, they've got 550 tons of propellant. And they're burning that propellant at the rate of about five tons per second. So uh, that explains why they're giving us about 6 million pounds of thrust at this point. At about 150,000 feet, they detach. We're going about 3,000 miles an hour here. And uh, once they detach on the solids, it's a pretty rough, vibrant ride. And then it becomes a very smooth ride from there to orbit. First order of business uh, after getting to orbit is to convert our rocket ship into a laboratory or a, a satellite deployment platform in this case. And so we swing open the payload bay doors about an hour and a half after getting to orbit. Taco is uh, working with Rommel to convert the, the computers over to on-orbit mode while we're getting ready in the back to check out the arm and get the satellite out of the bay. Um, we are, uh, we grappled the SPA satellite about three and a half hours into the flight and uh, some checks were performed both by the crew and the ground. Mm -hmm. And here we are um, taking the satellite out of the payload bay and maneuvering to the release position. Tom, uh, of course, is assisting me here with the arm. Um, there, everyone in the crew is involved in the rendezvous, in the RMS deploys. But SPAS was a model satellite. The spacecraft uh, performed flawlessly. Um, the group of folks that we worked with in Germany were um, just incredible to work with, incredibly professional and enjoyable to work with. So we were pleased to be part of the, the SPAS, the Orpheus SPAS mission. Here we are maneuvering again the SPAS to the release position. Once SPAS is in the release position and our window for uh, release opens, this is the end effector view. We maneuvered the arm, we release the spacecraft, maneuvered the arm away from the SPAS, and then very shortly thereafter, approximately one minute, Taco fires some jets on the orbiter so that we would. Uh, uh, induce a separation velocity between the orbiter and SPAS and send it on, on its two-week mission of uh, astronomical observations. And a short while ago, the crew released a U.S.-German ultraviolet telescope to observe, among other things, newborn and dying stars. On Friday, they plan to release another spacecraft in which they will attempt to grow a semiconductor film. Nach dem Start hat die Crew der US-Raumfähre Columbia den deutsch-amerikanischen Forschungssatelliten SPAS-2 samt Teleskop Orpheus im All ausgesetzt. Orpheus soll neue Erkenntnisse über die Geburt von Sternen liefern. Der Satellit fliegt in 100 Kilometer Entfernung hinter dem Shuttle her und soll in zwei Wochen wieder eingefangen werden. An Bord der Columbia befindet sich mit dem 61-jährigen Story Musgrave der bislang älteste Mensch im Weltraum. Die amerikanischen Raumfähre Columbia haben ihre erste Aufgabe erfüllt. Acht Stunden nach dem Start auf Cape Canaveral setzten sie in der vergangenen Nacht einen Satelliten mit einem deutschen Weltraumteleskop aus. Es soll in den kommenden zwei Wochen vor allem die Sternenwelt beobachten und vor der Rückkehr von Columbia zur Erde wieder eingeholt werden. NASA is trying to correct the vision of one of its telescopes, but for astronauts on board the shuttle Columbia, the view straight down is clear as a bell. The problem is with an ultraviolet telescope released from the cargo bay. Scientists are having trouble pointing the telescope where they want it, but say they are fixing the problem. Shuttle astronauts also have another satellite to release and a couple of spacewalks to perform. The sphere are lightning hits. There you see them. The shuttle took this video about two hours ago over Australia as a line of thunderstorms moved through. The camera is located in the shuttle's payload bay and is operated by technicians at NASA's Mission Control Center in Houston, Texas. In a little over an hour, U.S. shuttle astronauts will begin launching another satellite. The Wake Shield satellite will use the vacuum of space to create high-quality semiconductors. Meanwhile, an orbiting ultraviolet telescope launched on Tuesday has begun looking at some distant white dwarf stars. Astronauts also are preparing for a pair of spacewalks scheduled for next week.
around the mid deck, and this is the same secondary I'd mentioned earlier, running the, the capillary pump loop experiment. And here you can see it, and this is about as exciting as it ever got. <laughs> but it, it was a tremendous experiment run by the University of Maryland. Out in the payload bay, we had the space experiment module, a gas can type experiment with 10 experiments provided by students in high schools and colleges around the country. And they use microgravity to uh, great effect on our 18-day flight. Now here you see the sequence of uh, bringing the wake shield out of the uh, protective cone in the back of the payload bay, protecting the source cells that spray material onto the wafer growth surfaces on the, the uh, wake side of wake shield. This is, again, flight day four. And the first place we took the wake shield satellite was over the port side, pointing into the ram direction so that the contamination on the bottom of the shield here would be cleaned off by atomic oxygen in orbit. After a couple of hours during free drift while we cleaned the uh, wake side of the satellite, we then swung it over to the other side of the uh, payload bay to check out the attitude control system. And so we were doing a constant series of RMS maneuvers with some pauses in between while the shuttle oscillated slowly in free drift, getting ready for the deploy sequence. And here we go over to the other side of the payload bay uh, towards the ADAX checkout or the attitude system checkout uh, location. You can see the Sahara sweeping by in the background. Tom was saying here we maneuver the arm and study where the wake shield thinks it is in terms of its attitude determination system and we watch the responses of the, uh, the satellite to the RMS. After going to the ADAX deploy and then we go to a deploy position, uh, Tom has dropped it here, we study the attitude uh, determination and control system, its performance for one minute. We did get into a, uh, a little higher reaction speed here than planned, and as well, we had an eight degree roll excursion. And so uh, the Wake Shield community wanted to study this response for a few minutes longer. We did observe to watch the clearance with the uh, AF TV cameras. I'm waiting here to, uh, to start the thrusters. They're coal gas nitrogen thrusters, and here uh, the wake shield is thrust away from the orbiter. It's a der Satellit von dreieinhalb Meter Durchmesser wurde von den Astronauten der US-Raumfähre Columbia ausgesetzt. Drei Tage soll er das Raumschiff nun im sicheren Abstand von 50 Kilometern begleiten, mit einem aus dieser Perspektive kaum erkennbaren gemeinsamen Tempo von 28.000 Kilometern pro Stunde. Ziel des Experiments sind Untersuchungen zur Produktion hochreiner Halbleiter für die Computertechnik. Got a close look at one of the satellites it had released. In fact, a rather too close for comfort look. Columbia's astronauts heaved a saucer-shaped piece of equipment called the Wake Shield into orbit on Friday. Then it drifted just three and a half meters past the cockpit window. NASA scientists had expected at least eight meters. The satellite is designed to grow semiconductor film in the ultra-clean vacuum of space. It's now trailing Columbia at a more comfortable distance of 32 kilometers. Die US-Raumfähre Columbia hat heute Morgen einen weiteren Forschungssatelliten ausgesetzt. Er fliegt in einem Abstand von etwa 45 Metern hinter der Raumfähre und wird nach drei Tagen wieder eingeholt. Erstmals sind damit ein Shuttle und zwei Satelliten in einer gemeinsamen Umlaufbahn. Die Columbia soll in elf Tagen zur Erde zurückkehren. On Tuesday, the Space Shuttle Columbia began a 16-day science mission. Space Shuttle Columbia on a diverse Plans call for two spacewalks next week to try out tools and procedures that will be used in construction of the International Space Station. Near the end of the mission, the astronauts will retrieve two satellites they deployed earlier, an ultraviolet telescope and a device they hope can be used to grow very thin crystal films. Dings on its windshield. They're like the damage caused in the past by micrometeorites as the shuttle orbits Earth at about 17,500 miles an hour. Something even as small as a grain of sand can damage the vehicle. And of course, with every day in orbit, the risk of damage from space debris increases. The U.S. Space Command is tracking more than 8,000 orbiting objects, no smaller than a baseball, most larger. Here are the two satellites in formation with each other after Wake Shield has been deployed. They're about... Uh, 15 or 18 miles apart at that point, and we're going to fly between those two to rendezvous with Wake Shield. Uh, as you can see, we, we do need to eat on board, but you can define your own uh, kitchen table upside down or, or, or not. 
and uh, we do have to keep things clean. We, Rommel here is vacuuming one of the filters that collects a little bit of dust on it. We just vacuum the dust off of it, uh, one of several filters in the payload, in the um, crew compartment. Here on the aft flight deck, we have uh, all of our TV recording studio set up, four separate recorders to record SVS data that Tammy talked about earlier. And all of this data was shipped back to the ground after landing. We had a number of orbit adjust burns to keep us in the proper position with these two satellites. Some of them were fairly long, as you could see the plume <coughs> from the exhaust over the nose there. And we, we use the computers to tell us what to burn, but then we make the burns manually. And you can see how the, uh, the firing of these little rockets uh, shake the vehicle. You can see the computer on the glare shield sliding around a little bit. What we're looking through there is a little gun sight. We got the reticle turned down fairly dim so that we can see outside well. And wake shield was showing up in the gun sight. And uh, we're flying up closer to it. Again, we manually are flying. And, and you can see Tammy in the uh, window next to me taking sightings with the police laser. When we get it down over the payload bay, it's time for Tom to go to work and grapple it. It's remarkable how smoothly our pilots brought this spacecraft uh, into the payload bay envelope. I'd never seen another spacecraft in orbit before, and this one was remarkable in its stability. Taco parked us right uh, underneath it, and then we rotate the RMS end effector, get it into the right orientation for grapple, and then it's just a matter of going and closing the grapple pin and uh, not bumping the satellite out of the way in the process. So here we are closing uh, over the grapple pin with the end effector. We trigger the snares and then bring the wake shield back aboard after its uh, three days of uh, material science. Once grappled to the arm, we can bring it back down into the payload bay, and we even use it the next day for some space vision system experiments. Our flight deck uh, teamwork is very important as we bring it down into the payload bay. We even had space vision system here providing us berthing cues in addition to the usual TV camera and RMS digitals that we use for uh, standard payloads. Im Präzisionsmanöver hat die Besatzung der Raumfähre Columbia einen Forschungssatelliten eingefangen und in ihre Ladebucht genommen. Der tellerförmige Satellit Wake Shield ist der Prototyp einer Mini-Weltraumfabrik für ultrasaubere Mikrochip-Teile. In einem Vakuum, das 100 bis 1000-fach stärker ist als das, was auf der Erde erzeugt werden kann, wurden Halbleiterträger gefertigt, die so dünn wie ein Zehntel eines menschlichen Haares sind. Die Operation fand eher als geplant statt, weil sich der Satellit und ein zuvor ausgesetztes Weltraumteleskop schneller der Raumfähre näherten als berechnet. Die Wake Shield hatte bereits beim Aussetzen für Aufregung gesorgt. Der Satellit war in Schlingern gekommen und hatte sich dabei der Columbia bis auf drei Meter genähert. Die Besatzung der Raumfähre Columbia hat den Forschungssatelliten Wake Shield wieder an Bord genommen. Er ist der Prototyp eines automatischen Mikrochip-Labors. Unter extrem starkem Vakuum sollten dort besonders leistungsfähige Halbleiter entstehen. Ihre Qualität kann erst auf der Erde überprüft werden. Als die Columbia-Besatzung wie üblich mit Musik geweckt wurde, da hatte das Kontrollzentrum in Houston eine Überraschung parat. Ihr müsst heute flexibel sein, hieß es da von der Erde, ihr müsst den Wegschild-Satelliten früher als geplant einfangen. Der Grund, das zwei Tonnen schwere Ungetüm, war dem ebenfalls ausgesetzten deutschen Orpheus-Teleskop zu nahe gekommen. In Präzisionsarbeit manövrierte Columbia-Kommandant Cockrell die 28.000 Stundenkilometer schnelle Raumfähre in Position und fing 350 Kilometer hoch über dem Atlantik mit dem Greifarm den Flugkörper ein. Der Wakeshield-Satellit hatte auf seiner Rückseite in einem tausendfach größeren Vakuum sieben ultrareine Halbleiter hergestellt. Sie sind zehnmal dünner als ein menschliches Haar. Doch ob die Computerchips wirklich so gut sind wie angenommen, das wird man erst unten auf der Erde testen können. An orbiting telescope, all at 17,000 miles an hour. The wake shield produced seven semiconductor film wafers for use in electronics research. While astronauts and cosmonauts expand the frontiers of space, there are still worlds to be conquered on our home planet, Earth. Norman Reese reports on a British team trying to push the envelope in the middle of the Jordanian desert. It's one of the driest, flattest places on Earth. Ideal for preparations to break the sound barrier and on the way for the Richard Noble team to beat their own world speed record. But every pebble is a potential hazard and the track, all 10 miles of it, must be cleared by hand. The very first trial run revealed different, more serious problems. It was aborted at only 220 miles an hour. 
All right, gentlemen, well, that was the first run. The Driver Andy Green was to tell the press he'd experienced just mild steering problems. But as detailed examination of the track showed later, the reality was worse, much worse. The rear steering wheels of the car had actually taken off. Literally bounced. So the back end of the car has left the ground for maybe 25 meters. And if you look up there, you can see where, the, where it impacts the ground again with quite a wallop. Thrust went under wraps as the team worked on adapting the suspension. And out in the desert, Jordanian engineers smoothed out the worst of the ruts. And so far, the modifications are working. Thrust's latest run took it to 350 miles an hour. But it'll need another 400 on top of this to go supersonic. Norman Rees, ITN. Taking a new perspective, it can often change the way we think. And taking this perspective from the heights of space can make a world of difference. That's the thinking behind this book, Looking at Earth an unprecedented collection of photographs highlighting the planet's topography from space. What we've tried to do in this book is bring together um, almost complete coverage of the Earth from space. We've used sensors from spacecraft from France and India and uh, Japan, uh, as well as the United States. The photographs are both beautiful and disturbing. Hawaii's scenic landscapes maintain their majesty even from space. Three of its five volcanoes are seen surging towards the sky, but disaster is found in the waters of Madagascar. Deforestation and heavy rains have taken their toll, creating massive erosion. The pink color that you see um, indicates that the river is carrying a very heavy load of silt and sediments. This picture shows a nation at night. It's the United States glimmering as lights beam from its major cities. North of the U.S. is Quebec's Manicouagan crater, created by a meteorite. On the, the moon and Mercury and Mars, we see a record of heavy impact cratering in, our, in the early history of our solar system. Well, the Earth experienced this cratering as well. On another continent, the Byrd Glacier flows through the Ross Ice Shelf. It's one of the fastest moving glaciers in Antarctica, traveling hundreds of meters per year. This is the Sakurajima volcano on the southern tip of Japan. And uh, as you can see, it's, a, it's an active volcano. And it spews forth this uh, ash plume almost continuously. But hot spots of human origin are seen in the 1991 photo of Kuwait. As you know, after the Gulf War, uh, as the Iraqis fled from Kuwait, they set afire over 700 uh, oil wells. And we can see in this photo uh, the disastrous results. More than 100 images fill the pages of Looking at Earth, giving those of us with our feet planted firmly on the ground the opportunity to see the world from a whole new approach. We see a lot of, uh, a lot of damage that's been done uh, by human impact on the land, but I think that the, the photography is a good way to help uh, address some of these problems because when we combine the data that we get from space along with the data that we collect on Earth, we can um, use this combination of facts to help solve these problems. For CNN Earth Matters, I'm Sharon Collins. Tammy's here uh, with one of our long lens telephotos, uh, Hasselblad camera. And we'll show you a few views of the Earth in the movie here, too. <laughs> Notice the hygiene. Uh, hygiene's important in space also, so the uh, story was getting a little bit shaggy, so he's getting a, a little bit of a trim and a polish here. Also, I think you could define our crew as works well together. Uh, when we had an orange drink spill, everybody chipped in to help clean that spill up. As many of you know, Story was making his sixth flight on the uh, U.S. space shuttle, and, and while we were on, on orbit, he passed over a thousand hours of time in the space shuttle. So we, we came up with this patch that says Master of Space and presented it to him in a little ceremony on board. There's nothing like a walk to work up an appetite for or burn off the effects of a Thanksgiving meal. The five astronauts aboard the shuttle will postpone their Thanksgiving feast until Friday and the completion of a six and a half hour spacewalk. Here we 
are on the mid deck the day before the uh, flight day 10 scheduled EVA, uh, applying antifog to our helmets and also getting our tools in the proper configuration in anticipation on the EV for the EVA in the next day. Uh, Tom here has the shuttle power tool and I'm holding the new uh, station power tool that has some enhanced capability but as you can see is quite a bit larger than the shuttle power tool. Um, we spent several hours getting our tools in the proper configuration and everything laid out to make EVA day uh, go much more smoothly and efficiently. Tom is donning his lower torso assembly and it's always a bit of a squeeze getting into those pants. And shortly you'll see my head pop out of the, uh, the upper torso. And Story, of course, uh, was instrumental in getting us suited up and prepared to go out the door. The uh, crew got into the airlock. We depressed the airlock. The RMS got in position to view crew egress. We went to open the hatch. The handle rotated about 35 degrees and came to a hard stop. This happened uh, over and over again, more times than I can count. And unfortunately, we were never able to open the outer uh, eine blockierte Tür der Weltraumfähre Columbia sorgte dafür, dass der geplante Ausflug erst einmal verschoben werden musste. Nun überlegen die Experten, wie die Tür geöffnet werden kann. Auf dem Programm der Besatzung stand ein sechseinhalb Stunden langer Ausflug. Dabei sollten die Astronauten den Umgang mit speziellen Werkzeugen im All üben. The astronauts spent several hours trying to unlock a hatch, which would allow them to move from an airlock out into the cargo bay. Their mission is important because it's intended to test several kinds of tools that eventually will be used to build an international space station. The astronauts had to consider the possibility that the airlock would open, but then not close again. The two would-be spacewalkers had a difficult time trying to maneuver the lock in their bulky space suits. Another spacewalk is scheduled for Saturday, but it's uncertain whether it can go ahead as planned. <coughs> Well, we wanted to uh, get off on time so that we could get you all home uh, for Thanksgiving, but you can probably blame me on that because this is my third Thanksgiving in space. But here we are eating a traditional turkey. I had flown uh, during Thanksgiving with John Blaha back in 89. I wanted to fly in space again, and I did get to fly with him, but on different vehicles. <coughs> you all were nice enough to uh, patch us in with him. The moon from out there in space is very similar to the moon uh, down here on Earth. It goes through the same uh, phases, and we watch this moon grow to a totally full moon. So far, brute force hasn't worked, and astronauts Tammy Jernigan and Tom Jones have been stuck inside Columbia rather than outside spacewalking. NASA experts have been studying pictures of the hatch to see if they can work out what's gone wrong. But they say they still aren't sure how to solve the problem. It still could be that the latch mechanism itself is jammed, or there's a jam with uh, in some of the linkages uh, regarding uh, on the exterior in, in some of the linkage areas. Um, debris inside the latch mechanism is a possibility. We think most of those are fairly low, but uh, the latch mechanism itself could be jammed or broken, and that's still a possibility. There's not as much we can do about a lot of the other possibilities, so we also need to look at what are options we can work and what are things we can potentially try to do. It's the first time in 15 years of shuttle flight that a hatch has jammed in space. Get used to it. The evidence is mounting that more powerful and more frequent hurricanes are on the tropical horizon. Our greatest national threat from, from natural causes is probably her a canes coming in the next two or three decades or so the raw numbers hurricane specialists say may be a foreshadowing of real trouble ahead in 100 years of record keeping there have never been two back-to-back -back years as active and intense as the past two we think that we're probably undergoing a change to a more active regime like we had in the late 1940s through uh, early 1960s. Taken together, the 1995 and 96 hurricane seasons unleashed an unprecedented torrent of storms. In all, there were 20 hurricanes and 12 other tropical storms. What is of particular concern to forecasters is the apparently increasing number of big ones. 
In 1996, there were more major hurricanes than in any year since 1961. We had six major hurricanes. Uh, those are hurricanes that have wind speeds greater than 110 miles per hour. And typically, we only have about two of those in a given year. It's not a given yet, but the experts believe the atmosphere is going through a fluctuation that may last for decades, a change that's not for the better. If this does happen, we're going to see hurricane uh, damage like we've never previously seen it. That frightening prospect has not been lost on the insurance industry. Coastal residents can expect to pay higher premiums and higher deductibles. 40% of the population lives in the coastal counties between Maine and Texas. In that same area, we have over $3 trillion worth of insured properties. Some experts believe next year will be the third straight bad season, proof that Mother Nature is entering a period of unprecedented tropical trouble. John Zarella, CNN, Miami. An announcement is due shortly on whether U.S. astronauts aboard the space shuttle Columbia will take a walk in space. A jammed door prevented the space travelers from getting outside on Thursday. The astronauts attempted to force the hatch open while on the ground in Houston. NASA engineers took a closer look at the door's other side by using a robot armed with a camera. Three hours of brainstorming couldn't get the U.S. space agency NASA past a jammed hatch. The stuck space door threatens to scrap a planned spacewalk in a few hours. Engineers could not discover what's causing the problem. Speaking with reporters on Friday, the astronauts made it clear they're not giving up. Maybe warming up the hatch would be a good idea, and a number of these lines of uh, thought are being developed in parallel, and so we have been read up some of their ideas about uh, perhaps moving the hatch laterally as we rotate the handle, perhaps warming up the hatch uh, prior to the EVA. So there are many things that work in parallel, and we are, we are optimistic that we will get this hatch open. Well, mission managers admit a good shove might free the hatch, but it could also damage the shuttle in a way that puts the mission and the crew at risk. are canceling the two planned spacewalks for astronauts on board the shuttle Columbia. That after failing to open a stuck hatch on the spacecraft. Overnight, NASA officials on the ground discussed various options with the astronauts on Columbia in the hopes of finding some way to open the hatch. But NASA managers were concerned that should the hatch be pried open, it might not reclose. In the Ausstiegsluke in the Raumfähre Columbia had the NASA the Weltraumspaziergang of two astronauts endgültig abgesagt. Trotz aller Bemühungen gelang es nicht, die Luke zu öffnen. Ursprünglich war vorgesehen, den Zusammenbau einer für 1999 geplanten internationalen Raumstation zu üben. Der Raumfähre Columbia wird es keinen Weltraumspaziergang geben. Die amerikanische Raumfahrtbehörde NASA sagte den Ausstieg zweier Astronauten ab. Grund ist eine klemmende Ausstiegsluge. Trotz fieberhafter Bemühungen sei es seit Donnerstagabend nicht gelungen, sie zu öffnen, hieß es ursprünglich, sollten die Astronauten Jörningen und Jones bei einem sechsstündigen Aufenthalt im All den Zusammenbau von Teilen einer Raumstation üben. Two Columbia astronauts who plan to be outside in space for six hours this weekend are instead stuck inside the shuttle looking at the Earth go by 200 miles below. The faulty hatch, which prevented Thursday night's spacewalk for Tammy Jernigan and Tom Jones, still doesn't work. And after several days of trying to figure out why, NASA ground managers and engineers don't have a clue. We uh, have looked uh, fairly, fairly thoroughly at uh, jams or some type of problem in the uh, linkage mechanisms and the, uh, the dogs on the outside of the hatch, the part that we cannot access until we get out in the payload bay. Uh, there were several different failure modes that we looked at, uh, and unless the configuration of Columbia is significantly different from what we understand the other flight hardware to be like and what we have here in our training mock-ups in Houston, uh, we cannot uh, replicate the problem that they're experiencing on orbit. Here's the problem. There are six latches around the outside of the airlock hatch door. When the handle here is operated, all six are supposed to pull back, and three of them are supposed to actually push the door back into the area where the crew is waiting. The other line that we've drawn on the hatch. One fix for the problem, which was considered but quickly discarded, was for the crew to force the hatch handle to turn and open the hatch. The downside could have been a broken airlock, which would have forced a quick return to Earth. 
if it were to happen, uh, once the, uh, the astronauts are inside the airlock, they can hook up to umbilicals with electricity and oxygen. So they could hang out in the airlock uh, for quite a while if, uh, if they weren't able to get that hatch closed, and the crew could, in the worst-case scenario, deorbit and haul them out uh, when they got home. Still ahead for the Columbia crew, retrieving the telescope that's following them through space, and more time to look out the window at the cloudy planet Earth. John Holloman, CNN reporting. Columbia werden keinen Weltraumspaziergang unternehmen. Der Ausflug ins All wurde von der amerikanischen Raumfahrtbehörde NASA abgesagt, da die Ausstiegsluke nach wie vor klemmt und nicht zu reparieren ist. Die fünf Astronauten werden an Bord weitere Experimente durchführen und am 5. Dezember zur Erde zurückkehren. Recent setbacks in space exploration leave no doubt that the final frontier is still difficult and unforgiving territory. Problems with the current U.S. shuttle mission are the latest examples. CNN's Michael Skinner has more. It looks as if the crew of the U.S. space shuttle Columbia won't be boldly going anywhere. Not this trip, anyway. NASA has canceled the two spacewalks planned for the mission after astronauts failed to open a jammed hatch leading into the cargo bay. Their frustration is shared by scientists aiming rockets at the red planet. Three, two, one, we have ignition, and we have liftoff. The U.S. fired the first shot of this year's short and so far disappointing Martian space season. The global surveyor lifted off November 7th, carrying a satellite meant to map the surface of Mars. A solar panel failed to deploy as planned, but scientists say it's no big deal. Russia followed about a week later with a much more ambitious mission and a much bigger failure. The Mars 96 spacecraft, which carried two landers, an orbiter, and a couple of probes, never made it out of orbit. For reasons that have never been explained, the Russian space probe plunged back to Earth shortly after takeoff. Now, a third mission to Mars in less than a month has run into trouble. Dismal weather at Cape Canaveral has forced NASA to postpone Monday's schedule launch of its Mars Pathfinder. The spacecraft, carrying a small rover designed to explore the Martian surface, is programmed to land next year on the 4th of July. Taking no chances, NASA has decided the Mars Pathfinder will begin its 500 million kilometer trip early Tuesday morning, when the forecast for launch looks near perfect. Michael Skinner, CNN reporting. So the event was commemorated in the Oval Office. President Clinton awarded Lucid the Congressional Space Medal of Honor. Lucid says she's in great shape after spending more than a half year aboard the space, Russian space station Thank Mir. You very much. In other space news, NASA has just extended the flight of U.S. space shuttle Columbia. The shuttle will stay up one more day to make further telescopic observations. Earlier astronauts released an ultraviolet observatory from the shuttle's cargo bay, but they failed to open a jammed hatch. As a result, NASA scrapped the spacewalk schedule for crew members Tammy Jernigan and Thomas Jones. I was certainly surprised that the handle would not rotate um, as I had trained for it to rotate. Um, certainly was uh, frustrated, and so we tried to rotate a little harder and actually end up working for a couple hours trying to get the hatch open. So we were certainly disappointed, but also thinking that um, there was a lot of time left in the flight, and we knew that the ground team and the crew would work hard together to perhaps think of a workaround. Well, life has some surprises. And the fact that our hatch failed on this flight is a good reminder that space flight's a complex business, and we have to pay particular attention to all the details, including the ones we've taken for granted on past flights. And it's good that we had this uh, hatch failure on this mission in the sense that uh, the objectives can be rescheduled. Well, the 70-day flight is now scheduled to end on Friday. Shortly after the 1994 Pentagon launch of the low-cost Clementine satellite to provide a new map of the surface of the moon, it discovered something strange. So strange that the Pentagon wouldn't even reveal what it suspected until now. There appeared to be ice on the moon, a large body of ice at the moon's south pole, the side that has never been seen by man, the side that never gets any sunlight. Clementine found the ice by using its onboard radar to bounce signals off the dark South Pole. When those signals were picked up by huge radio telescopes on Earth, they matched the pattern for ice. Pentagon sources tell CNN the signals were detected in May 1994, but because the prospect of ice on the moon was so bizarre, 
It took more than two years of analysis to say with some certainty that ice is on the lunar surface. After all, Americans have been to the moon six times on Apollo spacecraft, and they never saw signs of any moisture at all. Sources familiar with the project say the ice field appears to be about 200 yards across and as much as 25 feet deep. A team of astronomers led by Eugene Shoemaker has been studying the data. The prevailing theory is that a comet, which is mostly ice, hit the lunar south pole long ago, and because that region is never turned toward the sun, the ice never melted. No, no evidence of any form of life in that ice, but we didn't know as much about the moon as we thought. John Holloman, CNN reporting. And the announcement that water exists on the moon has not come as a total surprise to some top pa uh, planetary scientists. Rumors of the find has been circulating for some time, though it hasn't dampened their enthusiasm. It is exciting because for life, you need water. If we're going to have humans on the moon, they need water. And at the moment, we think we've got to import all the water we need, water to drink, water to grow things, uh, water to extract oxygen. If there's water there, it makes the whole business of establishing a base on the moon a lot easier. Well, the U.S. Defense Department will hold a news conference in about three and a half hours from now to discuss the moon ice findings. We'll bring that to you live when it happens. Pentagon announced late Monday that there may be ice on the moon. That discovery from a small satellite the Defense Department sent to map the moon's surface. And ice on the moon, does this mean there is the possibility that there might have been some very primitive form of life like recently was discovered might have been on Mars, on the moon? I think that's probably very unlikely. Um, as you said in your report, it, it, it appears that a, a comet or an asteroid might have hit the moon um, and that would have deposited the ice. As far as we know, the moon is a dry place. I don't think that there was ever life there. But it is exciting. What does it mean for maybe the possibility of some kind of manned lab on the moon eventually in the long distant future? I think that's what you'll hear, hear talk of now. Um, the Bush administration in 1989 had suggested setting up a uh, permanent human presence on the moon uh, from which we could launch other planetary exploration. Uh, I think you'll hear that talk start again, but the Clinton administration has been very wary to take that up. But does it mean it's, more, it's possible or isn't there enough ice there? I don't think there's very much ice there. It, it could be possible, uh, although the funding is going to be an enormous problem. Auf dem Mond gibt es Wasser. Form in einem Kraterbecken auf dem Südpol. Diese kleine wissenschaftliche Sensation wurde vom Pentagon veröffentlicht, dem amerikanischen Verteidigungsministerium. Dieses Bild wurde aufgenommen von der Pentagon-Sonde Clementine 1. Mit Radiowellen hatten die Wissenschaftler die Oberfläche des Erdtrabanten abgetastet und ungewöhnliche Reflexionen entdeckt. Nun sind sie sich sicher, die Eisformation ist so groß wie ein kleiner See und zwischen 3 und 30 Metern tief. Wie ernst ist diese Veröffentlichung zu nehmen? Diese Frage will ich weitergeben an Ulrich Walter, Astronaut und Mitarbeiter der Deutschen Forschungsanstalt für Luft- und Raumfahrt. Guten Tag nach München. Einen schönen guten Tag, Frau Grunewald. Herr Walter, ist das eine Überraschung für die Wissenschaft oder gar eine Sensation? Nun, interessant ist es schon, denn Wasser auf dem Mond ist recht ungewöhnlich, denn der Mond wird auf der Sonnenseite relativ heiß, bis zu 100 Grad Celsius. Das heißt, normalerweise kann sich dort kein Wasser halten. Nun haben allerdings die amerikanischen Wissenschaftler auf dem Südpol, also dort, wo die Sonne nicht hinkommt, dort haben sie Wasser gefunden und weil dort eben die Sonne nicht hinkommt, bleibt dort der Mond relativ kalt. Und deswegen ist es nicht ausgeschlossen, dass tatsächlich dort Wasser existiert. Nun ist diese Sonde, um die es da geht, ja ein Forschungsgerät des Pentagon, also des amerikanischen Verteidigungsministeriums. Wieso forschen die auf dem Mond und wie zuverlässig sind deren Erkenntnisse? Das kam damals noch aus den alten Star Wars Zeiten. Sie wissen, in der Mitte der 80er Jahre hat der Reagan sein SDI gemacht. Damals floss sehr viel Geld und die Amerikaner, der Pentagon hat sich dazu entschlossen, ihre Sensoren, die sie damals entwickelt haben, doch irgendwie einsetzen zu können. Und sie haben sich damals mit der NASA zusammengetan. Die NASA sagte, gut, wir wollen eine gute Mapping, also eine Abbildung des Mondes haben. Das haben wir nicht. Und deswegen haben sie sich mit dem Pentagon zusammengetan. Und die haben also eine Sonde entworfen, eine ganz Hightech-Sonde, also eine sehr leichte Sonde, die damals nur mit diesen Forschungstätigkeiten von Star Wars möglich war, sind zum Mond geflogen und haben dort eben dann den Mond beobachtet. Wie gesagt, das kommt aus den Star Wars Zeiten und deswegen die Zusammenarbeit mit NASA. NASA macht allerdings den wissenschaftlichen Teil dieser Mission. Mhm. arbeitet mit reflektierenden Radiowellen, können die auch irren? Das heißt, könnten die auch von etwas anderem zurückgeworfen worden sein, außer von Eis? Ja, im Prinzip haben sie erstmal große Kameras mit dabei, um die Oberfläche abzutesten. Sie haben allerdings auch Radarsensoren an Bord. Das fun funktioniert so, Radar wird auf die Oberfläche geworfen. 
dann wird es reflektiert, kommt zur Erde zurück und dort stehen große Antennen, um dann diesen reflektierten Strahl zu sehen. Das Problem dabei ist, dass man nicht direkt sagen kann, jawohl, das Licht, was zurückgestrahlt wird, ist Wasser oder nicht. Das müssen Sie sich so vorstellen, als würden Sie sozusagen eine Taschenlampe auf die Oberfläche des Mondes halten und Sie sehen am reflektierten Licht nicht, ob das nun Wasser ist. Es könnte genauso gut ein Spiegel oder sonst eine gerade Oberfläche sein. Allerdings gibt es kaum etwas anderes, was so schön glatt und gerade wäre auf der Oberfläche des Mondes außer Wasser. Und daraus schließt eben gerade die NASA und der Pentagon, dass es Wasser sein sollte. Letzte Frage, was könnte man mit diesem Eis, wo es denn existiert, anfangen? Nun, das Wasser ist am Südpol, was für eine Station auf dem Mond nicht ganz so optimal ist, denn die Station, wenn, würde etwa in der Nähe des Äquators sein. Man müsste sozusagen immer zum Südpol runter, dort sich das Wasser holen und dann wieder zurückbringen. Auf der anderen Seite könnte man das Wasser zum Beispiel auch nutzen, indem man daraus Wasser und Sauerstoff herstellt, um zum Beispiel mit dem Sauerstoff dort zu leben, dort zu atmen. Amy, what was the Pentagon doing on the moon? Well, this uh, uh, Clementine project was part of a joint NASA, Pentagon, and Navy Research Lab project. The primary mission was to test uh, lightweight camera and sensing equipment that would possibly be used as the United States tried to develop a space-based missile defense. Uh, it was one of really hundreds of research projects underway to test that technology. And as part of that test, they were uh, mapping and, uh, and sending radio signals against the moon. Uh, this experiment, the, uh, the spacecraft didn't really have equipment on board that was designed to locate water on another planet, but NASA scientists sort of devised this experiment at the last minute using the spacecraft's uh, radio signals to bounce them off the South Pole region so they could look to see if there was ice. Now, scientists have suspected there might be ice in those polar regions for some time, but it took quite a bit of analysis to come up with the conclusion that, in fact, there was a large uh, pond of uh, ice in this very, very cold crater uh, on the uh, southern part of the moon. So, Jamie, what will this lead to? What is the significance of this find? Well, scientists say it's, it's very significant in that it uh, has great implications for future uh, travel to the moon in a couple of uh, ways. Obviously, uh, if there's ice, you can uh, melt it into water and distill it, and it can be used. Uh, also, oxygen can be extracted from it, and that can provide breathable air and drinkable water, which would not have to be carried from the Earth. But beyond that, oxygen and hydrogen, the key components of, uh, of water, uh, the components of water are also key components of rocket fuel. That means they could make a fuel uh, uh, on the moon, essentially turning the moon into a filling station in space, and scientists say that that makes the moon about ten times more accessible than it was uh, previously thought to be. CNN's military affairs correspondent Jamie McIntyre, thank you very much. Typical picture of our moon, but scientists have taken a closer look, and they think they see water or at least ice. The Pentagon says radar signals from an orbiting spacecraft lead them to suspect the presence of a huge ice deposit inside a crater at the moon's southern pole. And we're standing by for a press conference from the Pentagon for more details on their finding. Here in this very room to talk about the launch and the successful image transmissions from the Clementine satellite. Uh, the Clementine satellite represented a revolution in s uh, spacecraft engineering uh, because of the major cost reductions and schedule reductions that were uh, part of this project. Um, today we're here again uh, to talk about one of the many great discoveries that have come out of the many, many imagery, data, and, and other measurements that were made by the very advanced technologies on board of Clementine. Uh, we're very proud of this particular measurement because it represents something which we think is of very large importance and has a big impact on the scientific community, as well as our understanding of the solar system, as well as exploration and the future of, uh, of humankind in space as well. Um, the Clementine project, uh, first of all, let me tell you, was a, a joint project, something very, uh, very good took place in the government. The Ballistic Missile Defense Organization uh, was in charge of the project. The Naval Research Laboratory designed and built the satellite. Lawrence Livermore Laboratory built the sensor package that was on board. And uh, finally, NASA contributed by support, financial support of the scientific team that then analyzed the data, as well as providing to us the use of the Deep Space Network array of antennas to receive the transmissions back uh, from Clementine. So this was truly a joint government operation between many arms of the U.S. federal government. 
So we're here today to talk about this discovery uh, that uh, it took us a year to analyze this data and a year to get it published in Science Magazine. And so who, what I've done today is I brought three experts who represent uh, very different aspects of the Clementine satellite to help me describe this today. Uh, with me from uh, the, Na the National Reconnaissance Organization is uh, Colonel Pedro Rustan. Pedro was the um, project manager of the Clementine Satellite Program, and he'll be discussing immediately after me for a few minutes. He will discuss uh, the as some of the aspects of the satellite and why we this mission was done and what it meant to the Department of Defense, which I'm sure is a question that many of you have in your mind. Uh, following that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Stuart Nozette from Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. Stu was the person who envisioned the ICE experiment, how to do the detection using the bi-static radar, and he will talk a little bit about that for three minutes. And then finally ending up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Paul Spudis from the Lunar and Planetary Institute. Paul is an internationally recognized expert in lunar geology. He's a geologist, and he will handle the scientific aspects of the discovery and what that impact is for, uh, for everybody in the future. I'm sure you all would like to know uh, where this is all going and where it might lead, and he will be glad to speculate on that. So let me introduce, uh, let me turn it over to Colonel Rustan, who will talk about the Clementine mission. Thank you very much, Dwight. I'd just like to say that uh, why the Clementine mission was done and why the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization and the relevance that it has. Back in the late 1980s, the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, at that time the Strategic Defense Initiative Organization, built a lot of advanced technologies. This technology were about an order of magnitude smaller than anything that was available at the time. The reason why this technology were developed is because we needed to do a space defense. You know, there was a great emphasis at that time of a space ballistic defense that we needed to build a small satellite to provide space defense. So many cameras, many navigation and guidance systems were built along those lines. By the time I got to the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization in 1989, you know, it was very clear that there was not going to be a, a deployment of a space defenses. So what we try to do here is think about a way to demonstrate these technologies so the rest of the community could use it. Otherwise, technology would be sitting at shelf somewhere, and the commercial and the military community will not have access to it. So the Clementine, the purpose of the mission was to integrate the most advanced technologies that we have developed at the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization in a compact package and test it. You know, testing that package, the best way to do it, especially with multi-spectral images, 11 different images, is to put it together in a small 500 pounds mission. So you have here a 500 pound spacecraft. And you put that spacecraft together, and you fly it out in a place that you can collect useful information. And after a lot of discussions, you know, working with NASA and Department of Defense, we decided to fly the mission around the moon because we needed to demonstrate these advanced multispectral imaging technologies that we have developed. So there were six cameras and a laser altimeter, you know, mounted together in this payload. And uh, the mission was put together in 22 months at a total cost of $75 million which by any sense of the imagination is a revolution. Mission of this magnitude will have cost at least $300 million in those days and even today. So what we wanted to do is demonstrate the faster, cheaper, and better strategy. A lot of people had spoken about faster, cheaper, and better, but nobody had actually implemented, put it together in a way that actually makes sense. So here's a mission put together in a very short period of time you know, with the most advanced technologies and actually deployed to get not only the usefulness from the military side, so what the technology had to offer, but also scientific information that will help the community at large. So my next partner, my deputy at that time, Dr. Nosset, will discuss a specific details concerning the uh, the mission that we're discussing today, today, which is the biostatic radar, you know, that's something that was thought out after the spacecraft was orbiting around the moon. The spacecraft collected 1.8 million images of the moon, you know, and when the time, uh, when the spacecraft was orbiting the moon, the idea came up that it might be possible to look in deep into the craters in the South Pole about the possibility of ice on the moon, and that's the way the, the experiment was conceived. This was not designed, the spacecraft was not designed for that purpose. The spacecraft was designed to test all this advanced technology. There were 23 new technologies never tested before, and each one of these technologies was about an order of magnitude less than, than what had been done previously, all put together in this very compact spacecraft in a very short period of time. So I will pass the, the podium to my deputy, 
uh, Dr. Nosset, who will describe the actual radar experiment. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, uh, as uh, Pedro mentioned, uh, this experiment was really an experiment of opportunity. I think we had maybe thought about doing it before the spacecraft was launched, but we had so many tasks to accomplish to get the spacecraft to the moon. I think any mention of, you know, extra experiments once we got there were sort of uh, dismissed, uh, considering the, uh, the, uh, all the problems we had overcome to get it there. I think once we got to the moon and were in lunar orbit, people had speculated since the early 60s of the possibility that ice might collect in the permanently shadowed craters at the lunar poles. Unfortunately, until Clementine, no one had really taken a very good look at the lunar poles and weren't, weren't sure really how much permanent shadow was there. I think uh, the subsequent speaker to me, uh, Dr. Spudas, can elaborate on this, but one of the first things we saw early was that it looked like at the South Pole had quite a bit of permanent shadow. Uh, unfortunately, by definition, since it's permanently shadowed, nothing shines in there, there's no way to illuminate. Uh, what's down there. We didn't have anything on the spacecraft, we thought, until uh, we thought that, well, we do have something on the spacecraft we can use to shine, the uh, communications antenna. And uh, by static radar, I'll just refer to this chart uh, briefly, basically all that means is the transmitter and the receiver are at different places. And so what we were able to do is use the spacecraft antenna like a flashlight and point the antenna into the lunar south pole. Oops, I got my pointer here. The uh, key thing to looking to detect ice is ice reflects radar waves differently than rock. Rock basically acts sort of like a smooth surface, like a mirror effectively, and bounces them back with one bounce. The wave doesn't really go very far into the rock. Ice is very transparent and it's what's called a low loss material. It, the radar wave can actually penetrate in, into there and actually gets bounced around and rattled around and can bounce back like a roadside reflector. So basically what we were looking for is as the spacecraft came around in this angle, as it all lined up, you'd see a backflash, basically, of uh, radar signal right at that point. And the uh, other thing that happens, and this is somewhat of a technical term, is the polarization changes. The, the spacecraft transmits a wave of a certain polarization. Ordinarily, pure rock would flip the polarization 180 degrees. Because ice is transparent, the wave bounces around, some of it comes back uh, with the same polarization. And this effect has been observed on Mercury, on a number of places in the solar system where uh, ice is known to be, and it is considered somewhat diagnostic. And we see that effect very cor much correlated to this angle, so as this angle gets small. So we were able to take four measurements, uh, two measurements at the South Pole, two measurements at the North Pole, and one of the measurements, which was the measurement that uh, basically spotlighted the, the permanent shadowed area, did show this polarization effect. The other measurement at the South Pole, which did not illuminate permanent shadowed area, illuminated normal uh, lunar surface, did not, and as a control, and the two uh, measurements we made at the North Pole also did not show this effect, and Clementine showed that the North Pole had much, much less permanent shadow. So it appears the effect that we saw is what's predicted uh, for this type of uh, radar signature, and it seemed to be very much isolated to the South Pole. And in fact, uh, there is a graph over there that shows that we actually tried to uh, segregate the dark area in, and really isolated the fact that that return really is isolated in the dark area, and it is suggestive of, of uh, ice. So We've been watching that, a Pentagon uh, briefing on details of the possible discovery of ice. Uh, on uh, a deep crater on the south pole of the of the moon uh, what we heard right now was that uh, the Clementine unmanned spacecraft operated by the Pentagon uh, was not sent there initially to, uh, to, uh, to to find ice to look for ice on the moon it was an accidental discovery to send there to test technology that was developed during the 80s for the so-called Star Wars anti-missile defense program uh, we will uh, keep you updated on that story I'm Elitza Vasilova thanks for joining us Yes. No, come on. The female astronaut spent a record 188 days in space this year. American hero, President Clinton gave her the Congressional Space Medal of Honor today. First woman in history ever to get this. In fact, we have... Uh, we have footage of President Clinton giving her the medal. Unfortunately, I think the ceremony was marred. Well, here, you be the judge. Take a look here. This happened today. Here she is. Now watch. Now, can we put the camera? Now watch this. Now watch Clinton. Now look, see what he does. Look, he does. Now watch what he does here. Oh, now you see, there was no call. There was no call for that. There was... No call for that kind of...
kind of behavior. <laughs> I guess your NASA is still unable to get that space shuttle door open. Do you know about this? So the astronauts could take their spacewalk. The door is stuck. They can't figure out what is preventing it from opening. Uh, I think we have an idea. Can we show the door? Here is the door. There's, now, we have the NBC satellite. Can we show it from outside? There's a, someone's put the club on it. As you can see, <laughs> someone has sort of put the club on it. Hier in der Mitte soll er sein. Ein gewaltiger Krater, 13 Kilometer tief und darin in ewigem Schatten ein See aus Eis. Diese Erkenntnis verdanken wir, nein, nicht der NASA, sondern dem Pentagon. Dessen Raumsonde Clementine hat den bisher unbekannten, gefrorenen See aufgespürt. Clementine war ursprünglich ein militärisches Projekt, als noch jede Menge Geld da war für Star Wars. Als den Sternenkriegern der Gegner abhanden kam, wurde es umfunktioniert zu einer wissenschaftlichen Mission. Als einzige Sonde umrundet Clementine den Mond auf einer polaren Umlaufbahn. Das erklärt, warum man vorher nie Wasser oder Eis gefunden hatte. Der Mond wird auf der Sonnenseite relativ heiß, bis zu 100 Grad Celsius. Das heißt, normalerweise kann sich dort kein Wasser halten. Nun haben allerdings die amerikanischen Wissenschaftler auf dem Südpol, also dort, wo die Sonne nicht hinkommt, dort haben sie Wasser gefunden und weil dort eben die Sonne nicht hinkommt, bleibt dort der Mond relativ kalt. Und deswegen ist es nicht ausgeschlossen, dass tatsächlich dort Wasser existiert. Allerdings, es ist noch keineswegs sicher, ob das, was Clementines Radarwellen reflektiert hat, wirklich gefrorenes Wasser ist. Das Problem dabei ist, dass man nicht direkt sagen kann, jawohl, das Licht, was zurückgestrahlt wird, ist Wasser oder nicht. Das müssen Sie sich so vorstellen, als würden Sie sozusagen eine Taschenlampe auf die Oberfläche des Mondes halten und Sie sehen am reflektierten Licht nicht, ob das nun Wasser ist. Es könnte genauso gut ein Spiegel oder sonst eine gerade Oberfläche sein. Allerdings gibt es kaum etwas anderes, was so schön glatt und gerade wäre auf der Oberfläche des Mondes außer Wasser. Und wo könnte das Wasser herkommen? Nicht vom Mond selbst heißt es, sondern vom Einschlag eines Kometen, die bekanntlich zum größten Teil aus Eis bestehen. An sich könnte uns das Eis auf dem Mond kalt lassen. Wenn es nicht immer noch Leute gäbe, die von einer Rückkehr träumen. Vielleicht nicht mehr in diesem Jahrtausend, aber im nächsten. In den Schubladen der NASA schlummern Pläne, den Mond dauerhaft zu besiedeln und dort Mineralien abzubauen. Städte und Fabriken könnte man errichten und einen regelmäßigen Pendelverkehr zur Erde. Mit Helium-3 vom Mond, so die Vision der Zukunftsplaner, könnte man Fusionsreaktoren betreiben und so alle künftigen Energieprobleme lösen. Da möchten die Europäer nicht abseits stehen, auch sie haben einen Plan zur Erforschung des Mondes. Und da kämen Wasservorräte vor Ort wie gerufen. Vielleicht ganz gut, dass das Geld jetzt überall knapp ist. So hat man wenigstens noch ein bisschen Zeit nachzudenken, ob man wirklich alles tun muss, was technisch machbar erscheint. This is a shot of Flight Day 15, and uh, this is a day when we're rendezvousing with Orpheus to bring it back. The uh, Taco was kind enough. We swapped roles during this rendezvous. So I was at the aft station, and uh, Taco was in the forward station until, and now you notice Taco's in the, in the picture, until we got within 100 feet, and then he took it for the box ops and the graphics. Rommel and Taco did an outstanding job with the rendezvous. They put the spacecraft uh, very, very steady um, into the end effector camera. All that was left to do was a quick maneuver <laughs> and a grapple of the uh, Orpheus spas. Uh, post grapple, we did do a number of uh, maneuvers in support of some space station experiments, testing our SVS system and uh, making sure that we could get very good position and attitude information out of the space vision system in order to facilitate some of the space station construction activities. And this is our final berthing of the spas. The Pathfinder lifted off early Wednesday on its 500 million kilometer voyage to the Red Planet. An hour after blastoff, the spacecraft shot out of Earth orbit and began its seven-month race to Mars. The Pathfinder carries a robot vehicle, which is to explore the surface of the planet. And much, much closer to home, the crew of the space shuttle Columbia Wednesday picked up what they dropped off early in the mission. An ultraviolet telescope is now stowed in the cargo bay for the flight home. 
A problem with one of the shuttle's navigational systems has prompted NASA to bring Columbia home Thursday morning as originally scheduled, instead of extending the mission an extra day. Die Besatzung der amerikanischen Raumfähre Columbia hat heute den deutschen Satelliten Astrospass wieder aus dem All geborgen. Der Forschungssatellit mit dem Teleskop Orpheus an Bord war kurz nach dem Start der Raumfähre vor zwei Wochen ausgesetzt worden. Astrospass hat in dieser Zeit rund 150 Himmelskörper beobachtet und doppelt so viele wissenschaftliche Daten gesammelt wie erwartet. Columbia soll morgen zur Erde zurückkehren. See how they did. Here's how they discovered ice on the moon. Here you go. As you can see, and they go, oh, look at that. Oh, boy, look at that. Now, as you can see, there's... Now, here comes one of NASA's attorneys. As you know, NASA has attorneys on the moon. There they are now, probably some sort of... This audience, way too kind. Love <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you've been reading about that, that Mars probe we're sending into space, too. It's going to travel 30 million miles. And 30, 310. 310 million miles will be guided to Mars completely by remote control. Which is amazing to me. They can guide a vehicle by remote control that's 310 million miles from Earth. I mean, how do they do that? You know, I have to get right up to my garage door with the clicker, stand there for eight minutes. You know, you know you're going, ah, ah trying to get it to open yet these guys are 310 million go left go right they got the nintendo stick there. how do they do it? I, I don't know i don't know but you know what's interesting okay. Okay. Forget, that whole, forget that whole garage door thing forget that whole garage door thing i gotta have moon ice over the garage sometime. Okay. forget that whole garage door thing. i'm just saying it never even happened but here's what i find fascinating you know People are strange about this kind of stuff. You show them a photo from the Hubble telescope of a quasar over a billion light years away. You tell them that's hydrogen gas exploding, and they go, oh, yeah, right. Oh, look at that, huh? <laughs> Yet these same people, you show them a photo of O.J. Simpson taken five feet away, <laughs> wearing Bruno Mali shoes. They go, nah, it could be fake. Could be fake. <laughs> Looking down, we can see some very delicate linear dunes in western Algeria in the great western sand sea of the Sahara. This is a very early morning view. You can see the, the delicate uh, sculpting of the dunes by the wind. A little bit farther to the east is a big outcropping of uh, black volcanic rock. It's uh, dark gray because of iron and manganese in the rocks. And the tiffernine dunes that are there on the right side, the thumb-shaped dune field, is red because of the iron in the sand grains reflecting light in a different way. And it's a very beautiful dune field bumping up against the hard rock of the mountains there. Over uh, Central Africa, we saw a lot of burning going on. You can see several smoke plumes uh, emanating from the, the rainforest area in Central Africa combined with the, the grasslands there. And this was one of the hot topics we were looking for from space. We saw a lot of burning not only here, but also in Australia because it's the dry season there. A beautiful real-time sunset. Welcome to CNN's American Edition. On the return of the U.S. Space Shuttle Columbia. Heavy fog over the Florida landing site means the shuttle will stay in orbit for one more day. At the same time, Columbia will set a record as the longest shuttle flight. Bad weather prevented the astronauts from returning to Earth for the past two days. It's been a mission of mixed results. The delays led to a shuttle endurance record. The astronauts have been in orbit for almost 18 days. One problem they had to cancel scheduled spacewalks because of a jammed airlock hatch. Live event. I'm Veronica Pedroza at the CNN Center. We're briefly interrupting CNN Presents to take you live to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where the U.S. Space Shuttle Columbia is making its final descent to the runway there. As you can see, it's still dark. We're a few minutes away from sunrise in Florida, but the weather is clear enough to allow this landing. Fog and low clouds delayed previous attempts to land on Thursday and Friday. There you are, you can see the shuttle coming in from the actual runway at the Kennedy Space Center. Columbia traveling at the speed of 385 miles per hour at an altitude of just under one mile range to touchdown now four miles 
Commander Ken Cockrell continuing to fly manually as Columbia approaches the landing start. That bad weather I just mentioned made a record out of this mission, stretching it to nearly 18 days. That's more than a day longer than the previous shuttle endurance record. Landing gear is down and locked. Main gear touchdown. Drag shoot deploy. And nose gear touchdown. Columbia rolling out on runway 33, concluding a record-setting shuttle mission of 17 days, 15 hours, and 53 minutes. Right on time, the U.S. Space Shuttle Columbia lands at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This concludes a mission of mixed results. The astronauts had to cancel scheduled spacewalks because of a jammed airlock hatch. But the crew did succeed in releasing and later retrieving an ultraviolet telescope and a science satellite. Appropriately, on Saturday night, Mission Control woke the astronauts up on, with, a, with a recording of a song called Please Come Home for Christmas. A measure of Roger, the concerns. Roger, Columbia, will stop. Welcome home after your record-setting uh, missions. Stand by for post-landing deltas. Thanks, Kurt. It was a fantastic mission. We feel privileged to have been part of it. The Space Shuttle Columbia Thank lands your, after uh, that record-breaking mission. No changings for post we'll take you to a break now, but right after that, we will rejoin CNN Presents, return to the lion's den at the point where we left it. This has been a CNN Live event. And now it's time for entry. Uh, we've got a small camera handheld in the cockpit that allows us to pan around and show you the orange-pink aerodynamic heating outside the front cockpit windows as we go through about Mach 15. Out the back windows, you can see the plasma tail trailing us behind uh, as the uh, hot plasma streams around the orbiter and goes back over the tail. It's a spectacular light show. During that time where you saw the plasma trail behind us, we were uh, tilted up at an angle of attack of about 40 degrees. Here we are looking out through a camera over the nose of the vehicle, and, and now the angle of attack is much lower, and we're flying more like an airplane. It is dark overhead, so the only way to see us was with an infrared camera, and that's what you see in the upper right inset in this uh, view. We continue to have the uh, camera that's looking over the nose operate all the way to landing. And you see some lights on the ground, uh, and you can see clearly why I called it a night landing. And just up towards the uh, upper right and moving to center, you can see a dim outline of a long, thin uh, light area, which is the runway. We are diving towards a set of lights about a mile and a half short of the runway, which are lit up by strobe lights. And at about 2,000 feet, we start to pull out to uh, shallow our steep dive angle, which is 18 degrees up to that point to more of an airliner type uh, glide slope so we can land. At about 300 feet, uh, Rommel put the landing gear down and this is our view as we we're finishing that, that uh, pre-flare. On the left uh, is a, a string of lights with a little ball next to it which uh, we're trying to line up and keep in the center so as to cross the runway at the right height at the threshold. And with the uh, xenon lights providing the, uh, the bright glow on each side of us, uh, here's the touchdown viewed from the, run the camera at the far end of the runway. You can see the, uh, the vapor trails being turned up in the humid Florida air. At about 200 knots uh, on the ground, Rommel deployed the drag chute, and at 185 knots, we started the nose down uh, to, make a, uh, to get all three wheels on the runway, and we'll start steering down, uh, trying to stay on the center line of the runway because it's nothing more embarrassing to have the final photos of the, of the vehicle not on the center line. <coughs> uh, it's also helpful to stay out of the mud and the weeds. And <laughs> at about 60 knots, we release the drag chute so that it still has a good aerodynamic force on it, pulls it cleanly away from the vehicle so that it doesn't damage the engine bells. 
This is, after all, a reusable spacecraft. It was the 21st flight of Columbia, the 80th flight of the space shuttle program. Columbia ist heute Mittag sicher auf dem Weltraumbahnhof Cape Canaveral in Florida gelandet. Wegen schlechten Wetters war der Flug mehrfach verlängert worden und die fünf Astronauten stellten so einen unfreiwilligen Rekord auf. Mit fast 18 Tagen im All war es der längste Shuttleflug einer amerikanischen Raumfähre. Peter Klein berichtet. Es war im Morgengrauen um 6.49 Uhr Ortszeit, als Columbia endlich wieder am Boden war. Zweimal hatte die Landung wegen schlechten Wetters in Florida verschoben werden müssen. Bis zum Ende stand die genau 17 Tage, 15 Stunden, 54 Minuten und 20 Sekunden lange Mission unter keinem glücklichen Stern. Da klemmte eine Ausstiegsluke und hielt die Astronauten an Bord. Zwei geplante Spaziergänge im Weltraum fielen aus und mit ihnen die Erprobung neuer Werkzeuge für den Bau der Internationalen Raumstation. Doch der längste Shuttleflug in der NASA-Geschichte hatte auch gute Seiten. Da stellte Story Musgrave mit 61 Jahren einen neuen Altersrekord auf. Und da lieferten die zwei ausgesetzten Wissenschaftssatelliten gute Ergebnisse. Das deutsche Ultraviolett-Teleskop Orpheus machte einen Tag länger als geplant Aufnahmen von fernen Sternen, Kometen und Galaxien, bis es am Mittwoch wieder eingefangen wurde. Und im Windschatten des zweiten Satelliten wurden im Supervakuum ultrareine Computerchips produziert. And the longest space shuttle mission comes to an end after a series of nagging problems. Im All ist die Raumfähre Columbia in Cape Canaveral gelandet. Wegen schlechten Wetters hatte die US-Raumfahrtbehörde NASA die Landung des Shuttles zweimal abgesagt. Die fünf Astronauten an Bord hatten auf ihrem Flug zwei Forschungssatelliten, darunter das mit deutscher Beteiligung gebaute Teleskop Orpheus, ausgesetzt und wieder eingeladen. The U.S. Space Shuttle Columbia is back on Earth after more than 17 and a half days in orbit. That's the longest any shuttle has stayed in space. The mission had many successes, but also a notable failure. CNN's John Holloman has more. Many things went right for the Columbia crew. The launch was perfect. Two, one, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia. On a the release and pickup of various science satellites went like clockwork. The Wake Shield Space Factory did everything it was supposed to and is safely back in the cargo bay with some super high-quality semiconductor wafers, which will probably be used for making high-tech electronic equipment. The Orpheus Spa's ultraviolet satellite did its job of examining stars a billion light years away, and there were dozens of onboard experiments which the crew handled with no problem. The major disappointment came on Thanksgiving night when two astronauts training to build the International Space Station couldn't open the door between Columbia and the cargo bay. The hatch on the shuttle's airlock was stuck and the two spacewalkers could not do the work they'd come to space to experience. Uh, you know, we've got to deal with some failures occasionally and pick up our, uh, our uh, collective efforts and move on. For shuttle commander Ken Cockrell, it was a test for his entire crew. This flight has shown us that every once in a while life throws you a little bit of a curve and uh, we would like to think that it's not the curve that counts, but how we react to it. And for Story Musgrave, this flight was billed as his swan song at the end of a 30-year astronaut career. The 61-year-old spacewalker was disappointed his colleagues couldn't do their spacewalk, but excited to hear there's evidence of ice on the south pole of the moon. If there is ice and there is water out there, that is a natural resource which is extraordinarily important to establishing you know, a permanent thing such as an observatory in the moon or some kind of colony. After breaking the space shuttle endurance record, the astronauts finally came back to Earth, where technicians will begin fixing that broken hatch door and other equipment problems aboard NASA's oldest shuttle. John Holloman, CNN reporting. The shuttle will be towed to a hangar, and technicians are going to try to find out why the door malfunctioned. But NASA says it will probably be Monday before they know exactly what went wrong. Sekunden des fast 18-tägigen Rekordfluges der US-Raumfähre Columbia. Um 12.49 Uhr mitteleuropäischer Zeit setzte Columbia mit fünf Astronauten an Bord auf dem Weltraumbahnhof Cape Canaveral auf. Da die Landung wegen schlechter Wetterbedingungen in Florida mehrmals verschoben werden musste, war die Columbia länger im All als ihre Vorgänger. Astronaut Story Musgrave, hier in der Bildmitte, brach sogleich zwei Rekorde. Denn mit 61 Jahren war er außerdem der bisher älteste Mensch im All. Columbia ist heute Morgen nach fast 18 Tagen im All in Florida gelandet. Wolken über der Landebahn in Cape Canaveral hatten die Landung der fünf Astronauten um zwei Tage verzögert. Der letzte Shuttleflug in diesem Jahr war von technischen Problemen begleitet. 
Weil die Ausstiegsluke klemmte, mussten zwei geplante Weltraumspaziergänge abgesagt werden. Scientists have long speculated there could be ice on the moon, deposited there eons ago by comets that bombarded the lunar surface. Well, now a probe called Clementine has turned up hard evidence of lunar ice. John Holloman has details. In all the centuries that humans have looked up in the sky, the moon has been there. In the year 1608, when telescopes first made it possible to see huge craters on the moon, those craters were believed to be oceans, and astronomers gave them names like the Sea of Tranquility. More than 360 years later, by the time the first astronauts walked on the lunar surface, nobody expected any sign of life or anything other than bone-dry rocks, which is what the astronauts found and brought home. That's why the discovery of ice on the moon's south pole is so shocking to scientists. The Clementine satellite, built by the Pentagon to test sensors for incoming missiles, was launched in January 1994. The small satellite took excellent pictures of the lunar surface and also used a small radar transmitter to explore areas of the surface where there was never enough light for a camera to see. The radar test showed something strange at the moon's south pole what appears to be some scattered ice. For the first time, we now know that there are deposits of water at the south pole of the moon that are there, apparently uh, uh, accessible and ready to use for this purpose, both to support human life and to produce rocket fuel. Some analysts say water on the moon makes human exploration and colonization much more attractive. Uh, it gives you water for fuel, water for drinking, water for raising plants. Could be a great help because everything you have to take to the moon in order to set up an outpost there weighs weighs and it costs you money to get it there while the discovery sounds promising more experiments will be needed to know for sure if there's ice on the moon there's a plan to take another close look at the lunar surface between now and the turn of the century john holloman cnn reporting Pere colombia kehrt auf die erde zurück um 6.40 Uhr Ortszeit setzt sie sicher auf der Landebahn des Kennedy Space Center in Florida auf. In den vergangenen Tagen war die Landung zweimal wegen schlechten Wetters verschoben worden. Die fünf Besatzungsmitglieder haben den Flug nach Angaben der Raumfahrtbehörde gut überstanden. Mit knapp 18 Tagen war diese Reise der längste Space Shuttle Flug der Raumfahrtgeschichte. Während der Mission setzten die Astronauten zwei Forschungssatelliten aus. Außerdem wurden mit Hilfe eines Spezialteleskops Aufnahmen von entfernten Sternen gemacht. Bereits im Januar will die NASA wieder eine Raumfähre ins Weltall schicken. You are listening to the spacecraft Galileo entering what scientists say is a magnetic field surrounding one of Jupiter's moons, Ganymede. And this is the first confirmed magnetic field of a moon in the solar system. The waves picked up by instruments on Galileo, digitized and transmitted back to Earth, are played back at one-tenth the speed so we can hear it. Listen again. A few seconds into the recording, you hear a louder crashing noise. That's the moment Galileo enters Ganymede's magnetic field. Over the past seven months, Galileo has explored each of Jupiter's four largest moons. Io and Europa are made of rock, while Ganymede and Callisto are icy, 60% rock and 40% ice. But as scientists understand better what's inside these moons, Ganymede looks more like Io. They both have iron cores. So while on the surface, Io and Ganymede are very different objects, if you probe their interior, they're essentially quite similar. And the latest images from the moon Europa focuses on one section of that moon. We are blown away by this image. There are small ridges of ice in its surface running all across the surface, interwoven, crisscrossing the surface. Very complex and difficult place to understand, but we're going to have a lot of fun trying. Next week, Galileo will take more pictures of Europa, 20 times better resolution than these new images. Ann Kellen, CNN reporting. Well, circles orbiting it. A magnetosphere is common among the planets. The discovery was made during the Galileo's two-year tour of Jupiter and its largest moons. The spacecraft will visit another of Jupiter's moons, Europa, next week. Two major astronomical findings shook the scientific community this year. 
the detection of planets outside our solar system, and the announcement that there may have once been primitive life on Mars. As it turns out, these bombshells shook the religious community as well. This week, NASA scientists, religious thinkers, and the vice president all sat down in Washington to talk about the future of space exploration and the spiritual implications of life on other planets. And Kellen has the story. The discovery of other planets beyond this universe and the stunning announcement this summer of the possibility of life on Mars prompts questions not only about the direction of space exploration, but also about the religious implications of such discoveries. In a closed-door meeting, the vice president met with NASA, selected scientists, and members of the religious community to discuss what's next. I believe that many Americans, many people in this world, believe in God, different manifestation. Taxpayer dollars are involved, and I think it's crucial as we approach some fundamental scientific findings that we don't have science operating in a vacuum. The scientists say they want money to explore the origins of life. For example, what caused the Big Bang and the formation of this planet? How did galaxies first start? Uh, how did stars then form? How did solar systems then form? And then how did life itself come about? If scientists discover life on other planets, does that change the relationship of believers to God? I think it conflicts with the religion of some. Uh, my own feeling is, if I say a personal statement, my God is big enough to have created whatever we have yet to discover. I doubt that any religion will simply say, oh, that's wonderful, and just integrate it into religion. We're going to have to struggle with these questions. Religion and science may still maintain different worldviews, but new discoveries in the search for the origins of life are bringing the two together into common dialogue over the same questions, such as, where did we come from? And why are we here? Scientists can only answer questions that they can, that they can observe, measure, and analyze. We can't analyze why the universe is there or what happened before the Big Bang. All we can tell you is there was a Big Bang, and we're pretty confident of that. And while life on other planets is still just a possibility, religious leaders say their role will be to interpret discoveries to their communities. So they need us with our constituents to try to speak the language that we know best, the ethical language, and we need them to give us the scientific evidence. NASA may need support from these religious leaders when the president and members of Congress meet in February to discuss paying for future space exploration. Ann Kellen, CNN, Washington. One year after it dropped a probe down through the clouds of Jupiter, the Galileo spacecraft is now about halfway through the next phase of its mission, the exploration of Jupiter's four largest moons. Next week, Galileo will execute its first flyby of the moon Europa, which scientists say may have a liquid ocean beneath its icy crust. And Kellen returns with a progress report on Galileo's Jovian journey. You are listening to the spacecraft Galileo entering what scientists say is a magnetic field surrounding one of Jupiter's moons, Ganymede. And this is the first confirmed magnetic field of a moon in the solar system. The waves picked up by instruments on Galileo, digitized then transmitted back to Earth, are played back at one-tenth the speed so we can hear it. Listen again. A few seconds into the recording, you hear a louder crashing noise. That's the moment Galileo enters Ganymede's magnetic field. Over the past seven months, Galileo has explored each of Jupiter's four largest moons. Io and Europa are made of rock while Ganymede and Callisto are icy, 60% rock and 40% ice. But as scientists understand better what's inside these moons, Ganymede looks more like Io. They both have iron cores. So while on the surface, Io and Ganymede are very different objects, if you probe their interior, they're essentially quite similar. And the latest images from the moon Europa focuses on one section of that moon. We are blown away by this image. There are small ridges of ice in its surface running all across the surface, interwoven, crisscrossing the surface. 
very complex and difficult place to understand, but we're going to have a lot of fun trying. Next week, Galileo will take more pictures of Europa, 20 times better resolution than these new images. Ann Kellen, CNN reporting. Galileo's tour of Jupiter's moons is scheduled to continue through December of next year. And despite some nagging computer problems and a broken main antenna, NASA hopes to extend the mission beyond that. Hundreds of scientific papers, wrote eight books, including the Pulitzer Prize winning The Dragons of Eden, and was a professor of astronomy at Cornell University. Uh, we have swept through all the planets of the solar system, spacecraft of the United States and the Soviet Union, from Mercury to Neptune in a uh, historic 20, 30 year uh, age of uh, spacecraft discovery. Radio telescopes listening for signs of life in the billions of stars and galaxies, a program close to Sagan's heart, has so far received no response. It says something, therefore, about the rarity and preciousness of life on our planet. It's something that needs to be cherished, take, taken care of. So the flip side of not finding life elsewhere is a much greater respect for the life that's here. Sagan came close to death twice after being diagnosed with a blood disease in 1994. Bone marrow donated by his sister and chemotherapy put his cancer in remission. I'd like to begin with just a personal remark. I've been in uh, Seattle for the last five months uh, fighting a uh, life-threatening illness, uh, which uh, it looks as if I've surmounted. And. Uh, <laughs> Despite his battle with cancer, Sagan continued his dream of going to the stars. This job is by no means done. We will voyage on forever in the dark between the stars. Norma Quarrel, CNN, New York. Two-year battle with bone marrow disease. Sagan helped convey the excitement of astronomy to non-scientists in his lectures, his books, and his television series. Carl Sagan was 62 years old. New discoveries about Jupiter's biggest moon could help scientists understand how the Earth developed. Data from NASA's Galileo spacecraft suggests that the moon Ganymede has a lot of oxygen floating on its surface or locked in its icy crust. Some researchers think the oxygen is produced when ultraviolet light breaks down the ice into hydrogen and oxygen. They say what's happening on Ganymede could help them understand how Earth's atmosphere evolved. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth, and the earth was without form and void. And God said, let there be light. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion. The story of creation from the Old Testament of the Bible describes mankind as dominant over all other living things. Well, now scientists are discovering planets beyond our solar system and the possibility that life existed on other planets even before it existed on Earth. Will these discoveries shake the foundation of some religious beliefs? Scientists and religious leaders are grappling with these issues. One of the difficulties people in the world of religion have had is that we have had to fight against the sort of age-old belief that human beings are all that counts. And what science has helped to teach us is quite other than that. And that is that every microorganism has its reason for being. Humans have always tried to place themselves in a special place in the universe. I mean, you might remember back a few thousand years when the Earth was at the center of the universe. When Copernicus discovered the Earth was just another planet revolving around a sun, religion slowly adapted to the change and will continue to adapt as science explores new galaxies beyond this solar system. There are other solar systems. Uh, we're not at the center of anything. Our galaxy is just another galaxy among hundreds of billions of galaxies. Well, we're the only life in the universe. This is the last thing we have to hold on to as being special. But this rock from Mars, showing possible signs of past life, and a possible ocean of water on one of Jupiter's moons, Europa, cast scientific doubt on the idea that life originated on Earth and only exists here. Who is to say? that we are not all Martians, that Mars was the place where life first started. Some people claim long ago it had a more hospitable environment in terms of being warm and wet and so forth than the Earth even. It makes us less special, and I think maybe that's important for all of us to realize.
that this universe wasn't created for us necessarily, and the Earth wasn't created for us necessarily. All we're doing now is saying perhaps creation is broader, more extensive than we once understood. I don't think that has to threaten people's religious beliefs, but I think for those who are more fundamentalist, it will threaten their belief because I think their God is narrower. They are much more concerned about the dominance of human beings. Scientists are planning to send 10 probes to Mars over the next 10 years, and they hope to explore Jupiter's moon Europa. One goal to search for the origins of life, including how life began on this planet. Scientists now believe primitive life could have formed in hot water vents deep within the ocean. And as discoveries unfold, scientists will look to religious leaders for help in translating scientific findings to their communities. We're beginning to have uh, discussions between science and religion, and I think those will help us to, uh, to help the rest of the people understand that this doesn't have to be a threat to either. I, in fact, grew up as a Roman Catholic, and I haven't had any problem in dealing with my scientific life and um, any kind of, of religious beliefs. I think that they're quite compatible. Science is supposed to be disturbing. It's supposed to push the envelope. And uh, we need both. We need our feet and our roots, religion gives, and we need to keep pushing the envelope. And I think uh, it's a very exciting adventure for the, the world, fundamentally. The magnitude of the adventure will be decided by the President and Congress when they consider NASA's budget and funding for future space missions. Ann Kellen, CNN, Washington. Here we see our STS-80 flight crew. Astronaut Story Musgrave down on the end. He'll be in charge of the Wake Shield facility activity on this mission. Here's our flight engineer, Tom Jones. He'll be working the remote manipulator system, doing an EBA, and there's our commander, Ken Cockrell. There is mission specialist Tamara Jernigan, lead on our Orpheus spas, and we'll be doing one of the crew spacewalks. And there is pilot Ken Rominger at the end of the table. And the crew just getting ready for breakfast. There's the STS-80 traditional cake on the table. And when breakfast is over, they'll head down to suit up and head out for the launch pad, which is just about an hour away at this time. Here in firing room three of the launch control center, all of our activities continue to go smoothly. The final inspection team is on the pad. This is shuttle launch control at T minus three hours and holding where we're in the suit up room and we see our commander Ken Cockrell in his suit up activities today. Ken originally from Austin, Texas. And our pilot. Kent Rominger. Originally from California, and uh, STS-80 is his second space shuttle flight. Mission specialist, Dr. Tammy Jernigan, will be one of our EVA astronauts on this mission. And she will also be the primary astronaut taking the lead in the Orpheus Spas activities during the two weeks it will be in space. And going across the room, there is mission specialist Tom Jones. He'll be our flight engineer on this mission. And he will take the lead in operating the remote manipulator system, mechanical arm.
suit up activities are going smoothly and on time without any problems leading toward their walkout in about another 15 minutes. And there is Story Musgrave making his sixth flight into space, tying the record along with veteran astronaut John Young. He will be the lead astronaut associated with the Wake Shield facility activities on this flight and will providing EVA support while Tom Jones and Tammy Jernigan are out in the payload bay. This is shuttle launch control at T minus two hours, 55 minutes, 25 seconds and counting. Here we see the STS-80 astronauts leaving the crew quarters en route to the elevator to ride down from the third to the first floor to ride the astronaut van out to pad 39B. About a 20 minute ride out to the pad. We expect they'll arrive out there shortly after noon. And here they come. Boarding the astronaut van, or the very short leg of their 16-day mission. And here we see the astronaut van now approaching the ramp at the launch pad with Space Shuttle Columbia. They will ride the elevator up to the orbiter access arm. And one at a time begin boarding Columbia. We're in parallel. Preparations continue to get Columbia ready for its ascent, which will take overall about 40 minutes or so until it's actually in its final circular orbit of 219 statute miles. Very shortly, we'll be loading the orbiter's computers with the proper ascent profile which depends on the upper level winds at the time of launch. These are called eye loads, and they tell the vehicle what angle of attack to use at various times during the ascent and at various speeds. Shuttle launch control at T minus two hours, 34 minutes, 12 seconds and counting, where we've seen the astronauts arriving at the crew access arm, walking across the arm now to enter the white room. Some of the crew members will probably wait outside for their turn to enter. And as commander, Ken Cockrell will sit in the left front seat, of course, which is traditional, and then Kent Rominger as the pilot will sit in the right front seat. And then as the other crew members board, Mission Specialist Story Musgrave will sit in the aft right seat. This is shuttle launch control at T minus seven minutes, 35 seconds and counting. Bearing now to attract the orbiter access arm back into position very quickly if there be a problem. This is the main engine helium purge sequence which prepares the engines for main engine start.
engines now being gimbaled as a steering check for Columbia. Beanie cap, the gaseous oxygen vent hood now being retracted. Number cleared, unexpected errors. OTC copies. And Columbia OTC, close and lock your visors, initiate O2 flow, and enjoy a weightless Thanksgiving. Genesis, go for ET. Right, that's the first day, class. We sure appreciate all your work for this flow and this morning, and we'll see you in a couple weeks. I'll do that. Measurement of liquid hydrogen now terminated. The hydrogen tank is pressurized. One minute, 30 seconds. Sound suppression water system now being armed. Rocket booster joint heater is now being turned off. We'll check the booster commands. Locks and LH2 fill and vein valves are closed. Solid rocket booster hydraulic power units have started. Sound suppression water system armed. Rain safety systems armed. 10, 9, 8. Ignition sequence start. 7, 6. Three main engines up and burning. 2, 1. And liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia on a diversified mission of astronomy and commercial space research. Columbia, roll program. Roger, roll, Columbia. Houston is now controlling. The roll maneuver is complete. Columbia is in a heads-down, wings-level position, headed to its 190 nautical mile orbit. Twenty-eight seconds into the flight, Columbia's engines are now beginning to throttle down to 67% of rated thrust. As the orbiter passes through the area of maximum aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle in the lower regions of the Earth's atmosphere. Columbia now. Miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center at an altitude of four miles. All three main engines, APUs, and fuel cells continuing to perform well. Columbia Houston, go at throttle up. Roger, go at throttle up. Columbia's three liquid-fueled engines are now back at full throttle, 104% of rated thrust. Columbia now traveling 1,800 miles per hour, 15 miles in altitude, downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, 13 miles. All three main engines continuing to perform well. The next event will be the burnout and separation of Columbia's twin solid rocket boosters. Columbia Houston performance nominal. Roger, performance nominal. 
2 minutes 18 seconds into the flight. The booster officer has confirmed good separation of the solid rocket boosters and performance on board Columbia has been as expected. All three main engines are continuing to perform at 104% of rated thrust. The three auxiliary power units and fuel cells are also continuing to perform as expected. Columbia now downrange from the Kennedy Space Center at a distance of 55 miles, an altitude of 42 miles, traveling 3,290 miles per hour.
Houston, Columbia, in the uh, on-orbit multi-axis RCS burn procedure, orbit ops. We are thinking we probably could burn without opening up the uh, ohms helium, if you concur. We copy and concur. Okay, we're just going to leave it configured as is, and you won't see us going through those uh, if interconnect steps. We're on to step two. We copy. Columbia, Houston, we see good config for the burn. Thank you. Columbia, Houston, good burn.
tabulate position with the arm. Copy story. See, so at this point, uh, the crew has got this laser, uh, which uh, it u uh, they use to uh, to shine on the uh, on the wake shield, and uh, they get uh, range and velocity uh, marks every so often to uh, just keep track of the uh, of the wake shield. You can see that it's going right over the overhead windows uh, and off to the left of the ship. It'll be heading off towards the nose a little bit and uh, increasing its distance uh, from the the orbiter. Excuse me, Columbia. I'm sorry we've been so quiet. It's very difficult to get a mark with the attitude that the uh, wake shield is with respect to us. It uh, had a quite a different trajectory because of the length of time we set with it uh, before turning on the thruster. A lot different from SDS. Uh, so the uh, position that moved through over the windows and into the front windows has been very difficult to get a mark. We didn't really have a mark to give you yet. I understand, Taco, and uh, if uh, Story had a thruster on time, we'd take that. Thrusting, right, Storm? Yes. How's it looking, Rama? Houston, if you could pass on to the folks who built the tool bag, we're making good use of it during our EVA tool config also. Thanks, Tammy. We'll pass that on.
shoving arms and legs and every other thing I could to get in there. Houston, we would suggest while you have the handle off, go ahead and cycle the locking mechanism to verify that it appears to be functioning properly. I tell you what, that's just what uh, Mom ordered. Uh, what we'd like now is to have uh, Tammy uh, try to activate the lock and unlock mechanism and then try the handle again. Although you've got us such a good view, we can even read the unlocked on the tab. And uh, we're uh, ready to complete the survey, and we just saw a pretty uh, good bit of motion there in the linkage. Yeah, we see the motion in the linkage. What we've discovered so far, Bill, was the inner hatch handle on 
the outer hatch is that um, it doesn't matter whether the inner hatch handle is locked or unlocked, we still get about that same 30 degrees of play on the rotation of the handle, and we see the mechanism, the, the linkage is moving in response to that. But at some point, at that 30 degree point, something jams. And right now our thinking is that that jam is occurring in the hub of the, um, of the latch handle mechanism. Houston, Columbia, as you saw, we walked around slowly uh, throughout the entire hatch perimeter. Uh, we can't detect any displacement laterally, uh, and we certainly see no uh, gross motion uh, as measured against the markers that we put around the door yesterday at 10 2. So uh, we don't have any deltas to show you. Any other things that you'd like to see? Okay, we are uh, full closed, that is in the direction of uh, closed. And now I'm going as far open as the handle will go easily. And now I'm going to push those extra couple of degrees where we really come to a hard stop. Okay, we really appreciate that, Tammy. The, uh, closed direction. Yeah, that gave us a very good idea of, uh, of what you had told us in words uh, a couple of days ago, so uh, we really appreciated that. And, th and that concludes our, uh, our uh, requirements for, uh, for downlink of, uh, of the hatch. Thank you very much. That was excellent. You're welcome, Mark. Five, and that's arbitrary. Well, there's a counter if you can see it. Oh, you've already got five turns in there? No. Oh, it just counts as counts, oh, the problem. Count yeah. That's fine. That's either way will work. But when you're working, you don't. Exactly. And that's one of the problems of where that window is. That when you're working, the data you're supposed to be looking at is not in view most yeah, of the time. It's to here or there. Before. Most of the time, that's going to be on the head of you, isn't it? Yes, in my opinion, yes. Okay, go to four now. B4, that's it. Change so you should be reading direction. 10. This is keep taking it in here. And then you want to go through three clockwise. Yes. Five. Verified since zero. Zero. Position one. One. A and B connected. E press A. Transfer all into B.
This is Mission Control Houston. This television is showing uh, birthing of the Wake Shield facility that uh, take, took place uh, about an hour and a half ago. This is a uh, videotape being played uh, back to the ground from uh, the shuttle Columbia. Again, the Wake Shield facility was uh, retrieved, uh, captured uh, using the mechanical arm by astronaut Tom Jones aboard Columbia at 8.01 p.m. Central Time. All activities with the rendezvous and retrieval of the Wake Shield uh, went uh, just as planned as a Commander Ken Cockrell flawlessly uh, flew Columbia to within the reach of the satellite. All of that uh, going uh, just as scheduled.